Our next speaker is uh, none other than Dr. Radhika Natrajan, who's the Deputy Director of the Department of Cornea and Refractive Surgery and heads the Department of Teaching and Training in uh, uh, Shankar Netralia, Chennai. And she is going to talk on something so relevant to us in our day-to-day -day practice, recurrent SPKs, differential diagnosis and management options. Thanks a lot, Dr. Radhika, for being with us today. So on to you. Thanks a lot for having me here, Dr. Chitra, in this galaxy of Konya people. Can you hear me? Yes. And see my slides as well. So we know the thought hypothesis that, uh, you know, the Konya replenish replenishes itself on the ocular surface, that the cells are denuded and the cells are, uh, you know, migrating, uh, the two should match. But it's actually more complex than that. If you look at that little box, when the cells are getting shed and repopulated, the new cells, epithelial cells, should be healthy. They should stratify themselves properly and then they form the surface before being shed again. So if the shedding is not equal to the repopulation, then we get a corneal epithelial defect. If the repopulation is good, but the attachment is not good and the cells uh, erode themselves, then we have corneal erosion. And sometimes the cells which are repopulating are not very healthy and uh, the environment is not good, the stratification is not good, and then we get superficial punctate keratopathy, which is the topic of my talk today. So treating superficial punctate keratopathy entirely depends on the way it presents in the clinic, its severity and the appearance. Uh, conservatively, we could use lubricants. I'm not for using antibiotics. Some people patch the eye, people use uh, therapeutic contact lenses. And surgically, sometimes you may need to remove unhealthy epithelium. You may need to use amniotic membrane as a biological contact lens. You may need to do a chemical uh, tarsography with Botox or a surgical one. And if limbus is deficient, you may need to put the limbus back. But what is most important is if possible to find and control the etiology. Then you have a holistic approach and you have a chance of preventing this from happening again because SPK like fever or lymphadenopathy is just a sign. It belies a deficiency of health of the underlying ocular surface, which needs to be corrected first. The most common SPK that we see is associated with adenoviral keratoconjunctivitis. You see those dot-like SPKs, but what interests me far more is the second stage. The second picture shows you fine granular uh, infiltrate below these uh, SPKs, and this is a blink or miss stage. It's a fleeting stage. It's important to catch this because if at all you want to give steroid, it is in this stage. If it moves on to the third stage of scarring, you may treat all, the, all that you want with steroid. You'll end up only with side effect of steroid, but you will not have any effect at all. This is a patient with uh, microsporidial keratoconjunctivitis, very common in the rainy season. These SPKs have a characteristic stuck-on appearance, which you see over there. They debride very well. They debride very easily. And quite often, that is the only treatment that is required even though people use fluconazole and other medication. On debridement, this particular patient showed the characteristic, uh, uh, you know, small uh, rice grain-like appearance on the staining. And after that treatment, you can see that the cornea is looking better in the next picture. So this is a youngster who came with bilateral crater-like SPKs, the third variant. And this uh, boy had traveled to Canada. And because of that suspicion, we did a serology. His uh, antibodies came IgG uh, positive for uh, EBV, Epstein-Barr virus. And uh, however, IgM positivity is required to ascertain active EBV disease itself, which requires antiviral treatment. Since only IgG was positive, it's probably a remote exposure in Canada. And this set of crater like SPKs were treated conservatively for him. HSV keratitis also starts with superficial punctate keratopathy. You can see in the first picture, you know, fat virus laden epithelial uh, cells over there. These uh, accumulate or aggregate to form the classic dendrite, uh, which you can see in the uh, two pictures on top. And those dendrites coalesce to form the geographic ulcer, which you can see below. And later, when the disease itself has burned out, then you get epithelial roughening, which is quite different from the starting SPKs. And in this neurotrophic cornea, you can see those uh, areas of epithelial roughening around an epithelial defect, which is struggling to heal. Moving on to corneal dystrophies, uh, this is a case of bilateral epithelial basement membrane dystrophy. You can see the typical flower dusting of the uh, subepithelial cornea. Here, the uh, uh, attachment of the epithelium to the basement membrane is very weak. Uh, this picture is a little subtle, but this ASOCT shows it quite clearly. You have those deficits over which the epithelium is sitting uncomfortably, and therefore you tend to get recurrent corneal erosions like these. That is why the logic of uh, debriding the epithelium and treating it with a PTKSA, for example, to smoothen the cornea so that the epithelium can then sit 
better on the surface. So when you see bilateral, diffuse, dull, symmetric fluorescent staining like this, quite often there is a problem with the tear or the blink or both. This is a patient with the aqueous deficiency dry eye, but you can see a similar pattern also in patients with a, a, a reduced blink rate, both quality and quality of blinking, like in Parkinson's disease. Here is a patient who was treated for infectious keratitis. You see the first picture, the infiltrate is resolving, but the area of interest is the remainder of the cornea, which is looking dull and lusterless on its surface because of the toxicity of the medication. Once the disease resolved, the antibiotics were stopped and lubricants were instated. And then you can see in the next picture, the epithelium has rejuvenated to its glossy self. In medicamentosa, you see corneal spotting like this with fluorescein, but where you have to look more carefully is at the inferior conjunctiva. The second picture shows nice conjunctival staining, which may be your clue to the toxicity. Here is a patient with facial palsy causing lag of thalmos. Where the blink is not good. You can see that the eye is not closing properly. And in tandem, the Bell's phenomenon, which lifts the globe as a protective mechanism, is also altered. You can see both in the first picture. And consequently, you can see snaking epitheliopathy in the inferior half of the cornea in the second picture. So here is a patient who was referred to us, a young patient with bilateral large elevated SPKs. He was diagnosed to have Thygis and uh, keratitis. And uh, this patient, these patients, very difficult to uh, treat them without steroids. They're a pathetic lot who struggle a lot when you wean them on steroids. These large SPKs come back again. Thygesins is a diagnosis of exclusion. But there is one pointer which may help you. In these large SPKs, when you stain them, you can sometimes see negative staining, which you can see in this zoomed up picture. A lot of fluorescein around the large SPKs rather than actually into them. So moving on from global to focal SPKs, the first picture shows you cluster of SPKs just in the superior cornea, which obviously means there's something wrong just over there. And lo and behold, the second picture shows you a protruding suture nod. So basically the epithelium cannot jump over and heal itself. And that is what causing the disturbance in the superior part. Also a similar case where you have cobblestone papillae in a VKC patient where the lid touches the cornea, you can see SPKs or TOGB keratitis. And if left unchecked, you see below that it can also progress to the vicious shield ulceration. Sometimes you may not have a limbal deficiency. You may not have a healthy limbus. You may have what is called as limbal stress. This happens when the patient is on long-term medication, has been treated for infection for a long time, or sometimes has had multiple surgeries. Then you see this whirling pattern of epitheliopathy. Whirling is nothing but the normal migrating direction, centripetal migration of the epithelial cells. But here the cells are unhealthy, they move slowly. So you can see the fluorescent picture showing the whirl very nicely. It's a classic uh, picture. Should be differentiated from cornea verticillata, where the uh, limbus and the cornea are normal, but it's actually deposits of drug or storage material on the or into the corneal epithelium. Anaridia is a congenital condition which has got deficient limbus and these patients always have a sandpaper like a rough ocular uh, surface and because they've had this from uh, childhood all their life, you can see in this patient it has also caused a little bit of corneal thinning and scarring. This can also be seen in one other condition which is xeroderma pigmentosa which also has uh, deficient limbus. Here it is congenital, there it is because of photic damage but the clinical presentation looks largely similar. So this is a boy, a school boy, who came with bilateral coarse SPKs. These are the coarsest SPKs I have ever seen. They were, uh, the lids were normal. You can see in the inset over there. And uh, there was no autoimmune disease on blood test. And because it was bilateral and inferior, after a laborious analysis, we found out that he was actually instilling uh, hand gel into his eye sanitizer, into his lower fornix to escape online classes. So uh, even though we diagnosed this, uh, you know, after a multitude of uh, uh, tests and uh, treatment, factitious disorder should be remembered to be a diagnosis of exclusion only. I put up this slide for its, uh, you know, very different kind of presentation. Sometimes so when you look at the diffuse uh, illumination on slit lamp, it may be difficult to miss subtle or focal SPKs. You can't even see them in this picture. A good idea if you suspect them would be to throw the light on the iris and that indirect illumination may help you pick up the SPKs as you can see in this very same patient. This is my last and final favorite slide where uh, this is a 10-year-old child. 
who was constantly being treated for episcleritis elsewhere. Now that is always a red flag. So children don't get episcleritis that, that uh, commonly. And he was treated on a, a multitude of uh, steroid and antibiotic medications as usual. When he came to us, he gave a vague history of fingernail injury. And uh, the arrowhead points to the area where there was uh, conjunctival edema around the area of the fingernail injury, which was mistaken to be episcleritis. And when we stained him with fluorescein, we got the diagnosis. You can see the abrasion on the conjunctiva, both in the uh, color picture as well as in the fluorescein picture. So what was happening after the conjunctival abrasion was all the steroids and antibiotics were not allowing that area to heal. And it gave the appearance of an episcleritis. All we did for him after we picked up that stain was to stop all the toxic medication and give him bland lubricants and the uh, surface healed itself completely and he was very comfortable. So just like uh, recurrent corneal erosion, sometimes a recurrent conjunctival SP case may need to be considered as a differential in situations like this. So with that list of differentials, I close my presentation. Thank you very much for having me here. Oh, that was an amazing talk, uh, Radhika. We truly covered every imaginable possibilities. Thanks, Rudra Yes. Very exhaustive talk, madam. No doubt. I mean, uh, every DD possibly possible was covered. Uh, coming to the possibly the most common uh, cause for recurrent SPKs, which is post adenoviral, which we keep seeing patients coming. Uh, uh, two specific questions. Your thoughts on initiation of uh, povidone therapy in the acute phase. And in the later phase, how do you use? Cyclosporin, tacrolimus, and PTK for treatment of uh, recurrent uh, SPKs and, and eventual scars. So, regarding povidonidine itself, there is a lot in literature about povidonidine in the early stages of SPKs. Uh, I feel that if at all it has any role, it has a role in uh, superficial bacterial keratitis and adenoviral because povidone is a contact sterilizer, it uh, treats where it touches. So in any other form of keratitis with deeper involvement, povidone will not have any role. But adenoviral uh, being self-limiting, uh, there is a possibility that it can heal on its own. It's a pretty stinging medication to use. So that is the only downside of using uh, povidone. But uh, if the patient can tolerate it, it can definitely be tried. And regarding the, uh, the later part of the disease, there are some definite indications for starting steroid, which unfortunately are not followed very often. Like I pointed out in my presentation, there is a blink and miss stage where you have subepithelial infiltration. So if that happens in the center of the cornea and the vision is less to about 612 or so and the patient is symptomatic, then there is no choice but to initiate uh, steroid therapy. The other indication being when you have a lot of pseudo membranes, there again, you know, the inflammatory component is very high. These are two situations you have to initiate the steroid. You can monitor and taper it as quickly as possible, but uh, it's easier said than done. And more difficult is the situation where somebody else has started steroid in whatever stage of the disease the patient comes to you, keeps on throwing up those SPKs when you taper the steroid. I find that that is the kind of patient in whom I instill what is called as a very slow taper. A very slow taper where I bring it down to once a day and then if it recurs after stopping there, then I bring it down to say an alternate day for two weeks and then twice a week for a month and then once a week for about two, three months so that I hope that I can keep the virus at bay but not incur the side effects. And when it's down to that kind of a slow taper, I uh, start tacrolimus ointment two times a day, hoping again that it will take over from the steroid. And I should say that I've not always but had a fair amount of success with this kind of an approach. Uh Thank you very much, Radhika. Dr. Somshila and Merle, before you all go off to sleep, I'm going to ask you, uh, what would be your recurrence-free period before you decide to do a PTK for the scars? Dr. Merle, Dr. Somshila. Hi, yeah, so probably at least three to six months is what we'd wait for, because if you do it sooner than that, then uh, I think the I've not tried it sooner than that, but I think at least three to six months of quiescence and having patients on cyclo uh, cyclosporin or tacrolimus prior to that without any recurrences is something that we would actually hope for. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I would say, yeah, I would pretty much agree with what Noel said. Do you have anything important to add on this uh, particular, something very relevant topic? Uh, and but that said, I think most of the scars, most of the time post adenoviral scars, if they're not meddled with, they go away completely. So I think we should give a window, a long enough window for that happen before we decide on uh, uh, therapeutic. Yeah. Yeah. I was just going to say the same thing that 
the terminology they're not really scars i feel because they shape shift and if you wait long enough the shape would be different so there's a lot of remodulation or perhaps there's some inflammatory component which get goes away so we would really wait on these scars for a long time and we we'll document serially so that you know for sure that they are actually exactly the same like 3 months 6 months and then go ahead with the especially if the patient's vision is very symptomatic patient is very symptomatic for poor vision anything to add shreesh yeah no uh, this is regarding uh, povidone iodine uh, in the early phase of the uh, disease uh, that is uh, during the early stage of uh, uh, viral conjunctivitis uh it actually has a role in the lower concentrations maybe around 0.1% uh, uh, if you can prepare and give uh, and uh, if they use it uh, for times a day in the initial phase uh, the chances of uh, uh, those subepithelial infiltrates the development of this subepithelial infiltrate is uh, reduced actually this is our observation and we have been doing it uh, in a few cases selected cases and uh, Uh, the chances of uh, uh, subepithelial infiltrates developing it actually reduces the viral load in the acute phase and uh, it can be tried in uh, patients dr mal you have reduced this subepithelial infiltrate formation it's a grossly underutilized uh, substance i mean uh, there's a lot of literature already available which says that 1% as well as 0.5% has been effective in reducing the incidence of uh, subepithelial keratitis uh, but somehow uh, because of lack of availability of a directly formulated drop and having to make sort of variety of reasons this has not been taken up in a large way by most of the corneal as well as general of the uh, if i could just add a point see even if you look at adenoviral the spks are actually worse in the eye which was affected first and the reason is your bacterial load or your viral load was much higher there by the time the second eye gets affected you have some amount of natural defense mm-hmm. mechanism which is already set in that's why you will always the, the best way to earn the trust of the patient would be to just see him and then tell him oh, it started in the right eye first or it started in the left eye first the moment you tell that they, they feel that you you have hit the nail on the on the head so that also indirectly tells us that we need to to kind of reduce the load of of the bug at, as quickly as possible uh, apidine does have a role the only problem is the toxicity in terms of they are already so symptomatic that it, sometimes they are not ready to instill the the medication sometimes when the patient comes to the opd we just instill one drop in the opd and send it but then uh, asking them to use it unless the 1% is available or you compound and give it might be too irritating uh, for them and if they end up with an epithelial defect or something that kind of complicates the the matters but the study with the dexamethasone and uh, povidone iodine small, smaller concentration did definitely show uh, an improvement with respect to the spks thank you